down the rabbit hole. Alice was beginning to get very tired of sitting by her sister on the bank and having nothing to do. Once or twice she had peeped into the book her sister was reading, but it had no pictures or conversations in it. Alice thought, What is the possible use of a book without pictures or conversations? Suddenly, a white rabbit with pink eyes ran close by her. She didn't think that was so very remarkable, but then she heard the rabbit say to itself, Oh dear, oh dear, I shall be too late. Next, the rabbit actually took a watch out of its waistcoat pocket and looked at it, then hurried on. Alice had never seen such a thing before. Then, just as suddenly, it popped down a large rabbit hole. In another moment, Alice went down after it, never thinking how she could get out again. The rabbit hole dipped suddenly down, so suddenly that Alice hadn't a moment to think about stopping herself before she found she was falling down what seemed to be a very deep well. Either the well was very deep, or she fell very slowly, for she had plenty of time as she went down to look about her and to wonder what was going to happen next? First, she tried to look down and make out what she was coming to, but it was too dark to see anything. Then she looked at the sides of the well and noticed that they were filled with cupboards and bookshelves. Here and there she saw maps and pictures hung on pegs. Down, down, down. Would the fall never end? I wonder how many miles I've fallen by this time, she said aloud. I must be getting somewhere near the centre of the earth. Let me see. That would be 4,000 miles down, I think. You see, Alice had learned several things of this sort in her lessons in the schoolroom. Although this was not a very good opportunity for showing off her knowledge, as there was no one to listen to her, still it was good practice to say it over and over again. Presently, she began again. I wonder if I shall fall right through the earth. How funny it'll seem to come out among the people that walk with their heads downwards. Alice went on. But I shall have to ask them what the name of the country is, you know. Please, ma'am, is this New Zealand or Australia? And she tried to curtsy as she spoke. Fancy curtsying as you're falling through the air. Do you think you could manage it? Down, down, down. There was nothing else to do, so Alice soon began talking again. Dinah will miss me very much tonight, I should think. Dinah was the cat. I hope they'll remember her saucer of milk at tea time. Dinah, my dear, I wish you were down here with me. There are no mice in the air, I'm afraid. But you might catch a bat. And that's very like a mouse, you know. But do cats eat bats, I wonder? And here, Alice began to get rather sleepy and went on saying to herself in a dreamy sort of way, Do cats eat bats? Do cats eat bats? And sometimes even... Do bats eat cats? For, you see, as she couldn't answer either question, it didn't much matter which way she put it. She felt that she was dozing off, and had just begun to dream that she was walking hand in hand with Dinah, and was saying to her very earnestly, Now, Dinah, tell me the truth. Did you ever eat a bat? Then suddenly, thump, 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 down she came upon a heap of sticks and dry leaves, and the fall was over. Alice was not a bit hurt, and she jumped to her feet in a moment. Before her was another long passage, and the white rabbit was still in sight, hurrying down it. There was not a moment to be lost. Alice was just in time to hear it say, as it turned a corner, Oh, my ears and whiskers! <laughs> How late it's getting! When she turned the corner herself, the rabbit was no longer to be seen. She found herself in a long, low hall, which was lit up by a row of lamps hanging from the roof. There were doors all round the hall, but they were all locked. Alice went all the way down, trying every door. Then she walked sadly down the middle, wondering how she was ever to get out again. Suddenly she came upon a little three-legged table, all made of solid glass. There was nothing on the table but a tiny golden key. Alice thought it might belong to one of the doors of the hall. Alas, either the locks were too large or the key was too small, but at any rate it would not open any of them. However, 
On the second time round, she came upon a low curtain she hadn't noticed before. Behind it was a little door, about fifteen inches high. She tried the little golden key in the lock, and to her great delight, it fitted. Alice opened the door and found that it led into a small passage, not much larger than a rat hole. She knelt down and looked into the loveliest garden you ever saw. How she longed to get out of that dark hall and wander about among those beds of bright flowers and those cool fountains. But she could not even get her head through the doorway. Alice thought, Even if my head would go through, it would be of very little use without my shoulders. Oh, how I wish I could shut up like a telescope. I think I could, if I only knew how to begin. For, you see, so many out-of-the-way things had happened lately that Alice had begun to think that very few things indeed were really impossible. There seemed to be no use in waiting by the little door, so she went back to the table. She was half hoping she might find another key on it, or a book of rules for shutting people up like telescopes. This time she found a little bottle on it, which certainly was not there before. Tied round its neck was a paper label with the words, Drink Me, beautifully printed on it in large letters. It was all very well to say Drink Me, but the wise little Alice wasn't going to do that in a hurry. No, I'll look first, she said, and see whether it's marked poison or not. She had never forgotten that if you drink much from a bottle marked poison, it is likely to disagree with you. However, this bottle was not marked poison, so Alice ventured to taste it. She found it very nice. The drink had a sort of mixed flavour of cherry tart, custard, pineapple, roast turkey, toffee and hot buttered toast. She very soon finished it off. What a curious feeling, said Alice. I must be shutting up like a telescope. And so it was indeed. She was now only ten inches high. Her face brightened up at the thought that she was now the right size for going through the little door into that lovely garden. First, however, she waited for a few minutes to see if she was going to shrink any further. She felt a little nervous about what might happen. She said to herself, It might end in my going out altogether, like a candle. I wonder what I should be like then. After a while, finding that nothing more happened, she decided to go into the garden at once. When she got to the door, she found she had forgotten the little golden key. She went back to the table for it, but found she couldn't possibly reach it. She could see it quite plainly through the glass, and she tried her best to climb up one of the legs of the table, but it was too slippery to climb. When she had tired herself out with trying, the poor little thing sat down and cried. Come, there's no use in crying like that, said Alice to herself rather sharply. I advise you to leave off this minute. She generally gave herself very good advice, though she very seldom followed it. Sometimes she scolded herself so severely as to bring tears into her eyes. She remembered once trying to box her own ears for having cheated herself in a game of croquet she was playing against herself. You see, this curious child was very fond of pretending to be two people. But it's no use now, thought poor Alice, to pretend to be two people. Why, there's hardly enough of me left to make one respectable person. Soon her eye fell on a little glass box that was lying under the table. She opened it and found in it a very small cake on which the words, Eat Me, were beautifully marked in currants. Well, I'll eat it, said Alice. And if it makes me grow larger, I can reach the key. And if it makes me grow smaller, I can creep under the door. So either way, I'll get into the garden, and I don't care which happens. She ate a little bit, and said anxiously to herself, Which way? Which way? Holding her hand on the top of her head to feel which way it was growing. She was quite surprised to find she remained the same size. And to be sure, this is what generally happens when one eats cake. But Alice had got so much into the way of expecting nothing but out-of-the-way things to happen. It seemed quite dull and stupid for life to go on in the common way. So she set to work and very soon finished off the cake. The Pool of Tears Curiouser and curiouser, cried Alice. 
Now I'm opening up like the largest telescope that ever was. Goodbye, feet. When she looked down at her feet, they seemed to be almost out of sight they were getting so far off. Oh, my poor little feet. I wonder who will put on your shoes and stockings for you now, dears. I'm sure I shan't be able to. I shall be a great deal too far off to trouble myself about you. But I must be kind to them. Thought Alice. Or perhaps they won't walk the way I want to go. Now let me see. I'll give them a new pair of boots at Christmas. Alice went on planning how she could send her feet a pair of boots for Christmas. They must go by post, she thought. And how funny it'll seem, sending presents to one's own feet. And how odd the address will look. She read the address out loud. Alice's right foot, the hearth rug near the fender, with Alice's love. Just at this moment, her head struck against the roof of the hall. In fact, she was now rather more than nine feet high. At once, she reached for the little golden key that would open the garden door. Poor Alice. It was as much as she could do, lying down on one side, to look through into the garden with one eye. But to get through the doorway was more hopeless than ever. And she began to cry. <laughs> you ought to be ashamed of yourself, said Alice. A great big girl like you. She might as well say this. To go on crying in this way. Stop this moment, I tell you. But she went on all the same, <laughs> shedding gallons of tears, until there was a large pool all round her, about four inches deep and reaching half down the hall. After a while, she heard a little pattering of feet in the distance. It was the white rabbit returning, splendidly dressed. He came trotting along in a great hurry, muttering to himself, Oh, the Duchess, the, the Duchess! Oh, won't she be savage if I've kept her waiting? <laughs> Alice felt so desperate she was ready to ask help from anyone, so when the rabbit came near her, she began in a low, timid voice. If you please, sir. The rabbit started violently and scurried away as hard as he could go. Dear, dear, how queer everything is today, said Alice, and she suddenly burst into tears. <laughs> but she stopped when she realized she must be growing smaller again. And now for the garden, she said, and she ran with all speed back to the little door. But alas, it was shut again, and the little golden key was lying on the glass table as before. Things are worse than ever, she thought. Then her foot slipped, and in another moment, splash! She was up to her chin in salt water. Her first idea was that somehow she'd fallen into the sea. However, she soon discovered she was in a pool of tears which she had wept when she was nine feet high. I wish I hadn't cried so much, said Alice as she swam about trying to find her way out. I shall be punished for it now, I suppose, by being drowned in my own tears. That will be a queer thing to be sure. However, everything is queer today. Just then, she heard something else splashing about in the pool. She swam nearer to find out what it was. At first she thought it must be a walrus or a hippopotamus. But then she remembered how small she was now, and she soon found it was only a mouse that had slipped in like herself. Would it be of any use to speak to this mouse? Asked Alice. Everything is so out of the way down here that I should think very likely it can talk. So she began. Oh, mouse, do you know a way out of this pool? The mouse looked at her strangely, but said nothing. Then it started swimming away from her as hard as it could go. Alice too decided it was high time to go, and they swam to the shore. Then she saw a mushroom, about the same size as herself. She stretched up on tiptoe and peeped over the edge of the mushroom, and her eyes immediately met those of a large caterpillar. Advice from a caterpillar. The caterpillar and Alice looked at each other for some time in silence. At last, the caterpillar took the hookah out of its mouth and spoke to her in a sleepy voice. <laughs> Who are you? said the caterpillar. This was not an encouraging opening for a conversation. Alice replied rather shyly. I... I hardly know, sir, just at present. At least, I know who I was when I got up this morning, but I think I must have been changed several times since then. What do you mean by that? said the caterpillar sternly. Explain yourself. 
I can't explain myself, I'm afraid, sir. Said Alice. Because I'm not myself, you see. I don't see, said the caterpillar. I'm afraid I can't put it more clearly. Alice replied very politely. For I can't understand it myself to begin with. And being so many different sizes in a day is very confusing. It isn't, said the caterpillar. Well, perhaps you haven't found it so yet, said Alice. But when you have to turn into a chrysalis, you will someday, you know, and then after that into a butterfly. I should think you'll feel it a little queer, won't you? Not a bit, said the caterpillar. Well, perhaps your feelings may be different, said Alice. It would feel very queer to me. She turned away. Come back, the caterpillar called after her. I've something important to say. Alice turned and came back again. Keep your temper, said the caterpillar. Is that all? Said Alice, swallowing down her anger as well as she could. No, said the caterpillar. Alice thought she might as well wait as she had nothing else to do, and perhaps it might tell her something worth hearing. For some minutes it puffed away without speaking. At last it said, So, I... You think you're changed, do you? I'm afraid I am, sir, said Alice. I don't keep the same size for ten minutes. In a minute or two, the caterpillar mm. yawned once or twice and shook itself. Then it said, One side will make you grow taller, and the other side will make you grow shorter. One side of what? The other side of what? Asked Alice. Of the mushroom, it said. In another moment it was out of sight. Alice looked at the mushroom for a minute, trying to make out which were the two sides of it. As it was perfectly round, she found this very difficult. However, she broke a bit of the edge with each hand. And now, which is which? She wondered. She nibbled a little of the right hand bit to see what would happen. The next moment she felt a violent blow under her chin. It had struck her foot. She was a good deal frightened by this very sudden change. She felt there was no time to be lost as she was shrinking rapidly. She set to work at once to eat some of the other bit. Her chin was pressed so closely against her foot that there was hardly room to open her mouth. But she did it at last and managed to swallow a morsel of the left hand bit. My head's free at last, she said with delight. But then she found that her shoulders were nowhere to be seen. All she could see when she looked down was a long neck, which seemed to rise like a stalk out of a sea of green leaves that lay far below her. After a while she remembered that she still held the pieces of mushroom in her hands. She set to work very carefully, nibbling first at one and then at the other. Finally, she succeeded in bringing herself down to her usual height. It was so long since she'd been anything near the right size that it felt quite strange at first. But she got used to it in a few minutes and began talking to herself as usual. Come, there's half my plan done now. How puzzling all these changes are. I'm never sure what I'm going to be from one minute to another. However, I've got back to my right size. The next thing is to get into that beautiful garden. How is that to be done, I wonder? As she said this, she saw far away a little house about four feet high. Whoever lives there, thought Alice. It'll never do to come upon them this size. Why, I should frighten them out of their wits. So she began nibbling at the right hand bit again and didn't venture to go near the house till she'd brought herself down to nine inches high. 